extra excited about this morning um, and worship. We're doing some of like my favorite songs that I don't I don't really ever do here. So, um, and we're unplugged again because I can't figure out the mess of chords up here. Um, and I like the sound better anyway because then I can hear you. So let's uh, let's worship.
this morning. I pray that you'll be honored and glorified in all that we do. I pray that you'll speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand what you have for us this morning. I pray for Shalini, that you'll give her every word and every bit of time she needs uh, to show us what you revealed to her this week. Um, and I just pray that all of it would be an act of worship, Lord. Give this time to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Everybody, well, good morning and thank you, Kelsey. Gosh, what a blessing. I was thinking about that this morning. I know it's early, Tuesdays are early days. I was thinking about Jesse and Angie driving out from Timbuktu to come in here. At least that's how it feels to me, even though I know it's only six miles. <laughs> yeah, look at me, they're getting up earlier than I am. <laughs> Guys, we've got, um, let's spend about five minutes at our tables, kind of just getting our hearts warmed up and ready to receive the word um, from the Spirit of God this morning in Ephesians chapter 3. You remember that the, the letter to the Ephesians is broken into two halves, and chapter 3 marks the end of this first half of Paul talking to us and uh, teaching us, reminding us of what Christ has done for us and who we are in him. And then for, uh, chapters 4 through 6 are going to get to the very nitty-gritty of this then is how your relationship should be ordered um, in this family. We get into all kinds of very practical instruction. But before we do, let's just take in and revel in every last word um, in these first three chapters as we have this week and next week to do it. Okay? So about five minutes and then we're going to get started uh, in today's lesson. The questions are cool, by the way. Thanks, Trace. Yeah. <laughs>
change the questions. One more minute, and then we're going to wrap it up. And then did it work? Yeah, good, because everyone lost. I'm trying to make it bigger. <laughs> We're doing it beautifully. <laughs> it's, a lot of grace. Um, it's been on for 20 something minutes. Uh, okay. We're live right now. Oh, great. Okay. All right, ladies, let's go ahead and jump into our lesson and our text today. We're going to read through this morning the first 13 verses of Ephesians uh, chapter 3. And I'd like for you to do it, please, with a pencil in hand or a highlighter or some kind of writing utensil. And as I read this out loud, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, um, our, our lesson today, you can see it on your listening guide, is called Mystery and Ministry. So I'd like for you, please, to circle every time you see, the, every time the word mystery comes up, highlight it, circle it, okay, mark it somehow. And then in a different way, um, mark the word minister when we get there, and it is going to only occur one time. So we want to focus on those two words today, mystery and ministry. Okay, so you're going to circle the words, the word mystery, and maybe put a box around the word minister when we get there. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Following along in your own scripture journals. For this reason, I, Paul... A prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. All right, with those, how, how many occurrences of the word mystery did you, did you find? Four, right? Four, yeah, we should have, had, should have circled four um, words. They're mystery, they are all the same Greek word, and once we, we mark that word ministry. So with that kind of in mind, and that focus already um, uh, circled and boxed in before us, let's pray. And we're going to ask the Lord, um, as we go through this text little by little, to illuminate our understanding. Father, thank you so much for the morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for these sisters, for this word, for the blessing and the privilege that it is, Lord, to come to you as our Father, seeking from you, Lord, this morning, our daily bread, before perhaps we've even had any physical food, Lord. We pray that this might be food for our spirits, food, that kind of food that Jesus spoke about when he said to his disciples, I have food that you know nothing about. We 
pray, Lord, that you would come and feed us now, that we would come to you mouths wide open, and that we would leave here filled. For the glory of the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and his kingdom, we pray. Amen. Okay, so for two whole chapters now, Paul's been writing to these believers in Ephesus and in the surrounding areas, right, to help them understand, we just kind of briefly mentioned this, that these first three chapters, the first two we've studied, um, remind us of the greatness of the God that we love, right, and the greatness of the calling that we've received in him. Did you know that Paul actually never calls believers Christians? He never, he never calls them Christians. He identifies them by what we talked about that first week that we gathered. He identifies them by their gospel geography. He identifies those who are in Christ. That's how he, uh, how he marks and, and, and titles and identifies believers. So the question that Paul would have asked someone in that day to determine whether or not they were saved is not, are you a Christian, but are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Because... And this is where we just got our, our socks blown off, right? Because being in Christ, and that's what we read in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, means that those who belong to Christ have been blessed with every single spiritual blessing. This, this is a big deal. To be in Christ is a big deal. It means that we are full sharers in the spiritual riches of of God's glorious inheritance. And not only that, but that we have the full rights as the sons and daughters of God and the full responsibility of being brothers and sisters in his family. It's for that reason, we remember last week, right? It's for that reason, understanding that, that Paul tells them to remember who they were before they were in Christ. They were not always in Christ. And he says, remember who you were before you were in Christ so that you can rightly manage those brother-sister relationships. And that's what we have right here, right? That is what we have right here. We will be together as sisters in Christ for all of eternity. Because we remember that Paul tells us that we are, even now, being built together into a dwelling place for God himself by the Holy Spirit. And that because of that name and that inheritance, that we've received, right? Remember through the mercy and the love and the grace of God that was achieved, that was secured by the work of Christ on the cross, that we have a share, we have a share of the eternal hope of the unsearchable riches and the incomparable power of Jesus Christ. For this reason, now, Paul begins, for this reason, that's chapters one and two, for this reason, Paul starts, in verse 1. And then he goes on and he goes on to identify his situation. Here it comes. He says he calls himself a prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, I, hopefully you had a chance to go back and to read through beginning in Acts chapter 21, 27 through the end. And you know, and we talked last week about how uh, the reason that Paul is a prisoner in Rome, the reason he's sitting and writing, I feel like I, you know, uh, do a lot of writing, and, and it seems like the Lord often puts people in prison um, who love him to write. Have you noticed that, Lord? Yeah. I mean, this is where John is writing, right, the Revelation. This is where um, we get Pilgrim's Progress, mm -hmm. right, a 12 years in prison for not going to church. That's, <laughs> that's what that book was born out of. Okay, and here we are. We've got Paul in prison in Rome precisely because of these people. This is why. And he says that, and he's very, he's very um, upfront about that. We learn from Acts chapter 21 that there's possibly even one Ephesian in particular by the name of Trophimus that Paul had gotten into hot water with the Jews. Because the reality is that Paul had been teaching Gentiles in Jerusalem. And he had been teaching that both to Jews and to Gentiles that the Gentiles were to be fully included in God's plan of salvation. And that was such a divisive, such an offensive message to the Jews that they did not just, they weren't attempting to put him in prison. What were they trying to do? They were trying to kill him in front of the temple. Can you imagine witnessing a murder in front of the ministry center at, at First Baptist Church? I mean, can you imagine that? They're trying to kill him in front of the temple, but they, they succeed only in having him arrested 
and imprisoned. But I want you to look again. Look at the little clause again, okay, in verse 1. Look carefully at the way Paul says this. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner of who? Of, ah, of Christ Jesus, right? Now, John Stott writes this. He says, humanly speaking, Paul was not Christ's prisoner, but Nero's. He had appealed to the emperor, and so to the emperor he had been committed to trial, for trial. But Paul never did think or speak purely in human terms. He believed in the sovereignty of God over the affairs of men. Therefore, he called himself literally a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So convinced was he that the whole of his life, including his wearisome imprisonment, was under the lordship of Christ. This is not the focus of the lesson, but I wanted to give us just an opportunity just to stop for a second and, and look at what Paul has written and consider our own lives and our own circumstances. Like, do we consider ourselves the victims of the people or the powers around us? Or do we understand, like Paul, do we really believe that we belong to Christ to such an extent that everything God allows in our lives, he allows for his eternal purposes. In us and through us. Because the scripture teaches us clearly that God does not justify those who he does not sanctify. And I just want to leave that question there um, for consideration, for meditation throughout the week. But our lesson today is going to focus on these two big words that we've marked together. Now, again, just continuing here through the scripture, you're going to notice at the end of verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then a particular punctuation mark. What is that? A yeah, a dash, right? Okay, so we've got a big dash right here. So what, what's happening right here is that Paul, after having told the Ephesian believers and us by extension about who God is and what our calling, our great calling is in him, he's getting ready to, to like burst into prayer again. That's what he's doing. For this reason, I, Paul, and he's getting ready to say, bow my knees before the Father in verse 14. But before he does this, he makes this 12-verse digression, and he keeps doing this. I love this about, about Paul and the way that he writes, right? So it's this like interruption in this thought and so that's where we get this dash. And he says, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard, here he goes, okay, into this, into this little diversion. And we're going to go there with him today. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, just jot down right there if, you're, if you've got your pencil, this little cross-reference, Galatians 1. Verses 11 through 24, you're going to remember, Paul went into, that's the first letter, probably, right? We think that Paul wrote is the letter to the Galatians. And we remember how he went into to great lengths to tell them um, that he had received the gospel through revelation, not through instruction by any other um, apostles. Remember that? He didn't go down to talk to them. He received it directly um, by, through Jesus Christ by revelation. So he says, a mystery was made known to me by, by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, that is this letter, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Three times in this short little paragraph right here, okay, so verses uh, 1 through 6 that we just finished, Paul uses that word mystery. We need to realize, this is John Scott writing, and this is important. That's okay, no problem. That's all right. As I was listening to probably that same voice this morning. I listened to John McLean read me the whole letter of uh, Ephesians this morning. Uh, Paul uses that word mystery, right? Okay, so we need to realize, here's John Stott, that the English and Greek words do not have the same meaning. The, the word mystery in English doesn't mean what it means in the Greek. That's why I had you circle it every time that it appeared. Okay, he says, in English, a mystery is something dark, obscure, secret, puzzling. 
What is mysterious is inexplicable, even incomprehensible. The Greek word mysterion is different. Although still a secret, it is no longer closely guarded, but open. More simply, mysterion is a truth hitherto hidden from human knowledge or understanding, but now disclosed by the revelation of God. Now, again, words are going to be really important to our understanding of this passage. So let's do a little bit of work. That's a wonderful paragraph that John Stott wrote. But I want you to see it even in, in greater depth okay, than this. So we're going to look at the word mystery in the Greek. I gave you here sort of what I call the fine print. There's the, uh, the Strong's Greek concordance number. Every word, if you don't know this already, every word in the Bible has been categorized and cataloged by number um, and is defined by uh, a concordance They're called Strong's uh, Greek concordance. Well, concordance, there's a Hebrew concordance as well. You can look up a word by number. You can see it there written in the Greek. You see the transliteration. A transliteration is where we take a word from another language and we use English letters to write it out so that we can do our best to pronounce it. Um, and this one is actually like musterion or something like that, I think is the way that you pronounce it. There's a lot of Greek words today. I won't pronounce them all because I don't know how. Um, and then I've given you the definition here. So the definition, the technical definition is a mystery, secret, of which initiation is necessary. In the New Testament, the counsels of God, once hidden, but now revealed in the gospel. Um, we have a word study here that's going to help us as we look at the roots of this word. Okay, and so we kind of put it together and, and understand in a greater way what it means. The root of the English term mystery in the Bible this particular word, 3466, mysterion, is not something unknowable. A mystery is not something unknowable. Rather, it is what can only be known through revelation because God reveals it. Here's the bottom line. I want to try to give us a little summary that helps us understand what's, what we are seeking to uh, understand from the word this morning. In the Bible, here come your blanks. A mystery is something that can only be known through revelation. Okay, so in the Bible, a mystery is something that can only be known through revelation. It cannot be discovered through investigation. No amount of study, no amount of investigation is going to give us insight into what God calls the mystery of Christ. Now, Paul reminds us of this, and you can jot this little, um, we've seen this now, we've looked at it a number of times, but 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, and then we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 through 6. Okay, so it's Paul, again, he's writing now to, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 14, trying to explain this phenomenon. He says, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received this, not the spirit, not, excuse me, let me do that again. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. You want to know why um, unbelievers can't understand what's in this word? It's because they don't have the spirit. The, verse 13 in 1 Corinthians 2. And we impart this word, this, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If you have a loved one in your life who has not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ, stop arguing with them about the things in this book and start praying for the Spirit of God to illuminate what it is that he is saying here because the things of the Spirit are spiritually discerned because that is who we are. We are eternally spiritual. These are spiritual blessings. There is a spiritual kingdom. That doesn't mean that it's not a physical kingdom, but it means that it is experienced in a realm that we cannot see with our earthly eyes. We see this teaching and this idea taught consistently throughout the scriptures, right? And this one we have um, heard probably many times as Paul's writing to the Corinthians, this time 2 Corinthians 4, verses 4 through 6, regarding why there are some who do not receive their message, he says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers to keep them from seeing 
the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, even those who who want to know what this word is all about, who are searching and seeking for him, but do not yet have the spirit, right, will not find him unless God gives light to their spiritual eyes. You remember, we see this in a very dramatic way um, when the Magi were looking for the Christ. Remember that? Okay. They, they knew they had studied the scriptures. They knew that there was a Messiah that would be born king of the Jews, and they desperately wanted to find him. So they searched they searched, they searched the scriptures, they studied, they did their best to try to put those clues together. But even when they reached King Herod, right, even when they reached him there in Jerusalem, even he could not tell them the location of that Christ child. What was it? What was it that gave them guidance and direction? It was a light. It was a literal light, right, that God had provided that led them straight to the one that they were seeking because our God promises, Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's why the Magi were able to find him because that's how they were seeking. And he gives them a light. Now again, back to 1 Corinthians, uh, this passage we have looked at together extensively in one of our previous lessons, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 10, Paul writes, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Here's that language again. Here's the mystery. We impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Not something that can't be known, but something that must be revealed. Truth that has to be revealed. Which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So, when we understand, then, this word mystery, as Paul uses it here, we, we get the, this concept that a mystery here in Paul's, uh, a, a, an unveiled mystery is a revealed truth. That's what we need to understand. That's what's going to lead us then to our primary question. Now here comes our, here come your next blanks. What is it? What is this mystery that Paul is writing uh, to the, the Ephesians about here? Now we don't have to guess because it's clear. It's in the very next verse. We don't have to make anything up, right? I mean, literally fill in the blanks here as he says. He spells it out in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And we have looked at those now in this study from these first two chapters extensively. But what's really cool, if you could see it in the original language here, and so that's what I want to show you, even though I won't be able to pronounce these words correctly, what I want to show you is that those three identifiers, maybe circle them or highlight them or something, fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise. So mark each one of those as a single entity because they're all single words in the Greek. Fellow heirs is one word, members of the same body is one word, and partakers of the promise is one word. And they all begin with the same Greek prefix, or at least a form of it, which is that prefix, and you've got it in your notes, S-Y-N. That Greek prefix means together with, together with. And it indicates what we have been learning, which is that the Gentile believers are now in full partnership with all the rights and responsibilities, right, of their fellow believing Jews. They have formed by the mercy, grace, and love of God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the spirit building now a new body, a new humanity, which is called the church. Right? And in the church, the plan of the mystery hidden for ages of God, in God, 
which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, but has now been revealed by the Spirit, is these three words. And you see them here in the Greek, the sinclair, sinclaironoma, sisoma, simatoka. Those three words, fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise. The, the, the gist of it is together with, together with. The Gentiles, and please write this down, I forgot to, I, it's fixed on the document now, so if you're studying with us online, your listening guide should be accurate, but just in case you're hearing it isn't, I forgot to put these few words. The Gentiles are fellow heirs of the, and here's your two blanks, the same blessing. Okay, that's what this word means, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs of the same blessing. They're members of the same body, those are your next two blanks, letter B. And they are partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Same blessing, the same body, the same promise together with. So here's the summary. The mystery of Christ is the double union of Jews and Gentiles with Christ and with each other. There's a double union. And that's because in the last chapter, Paul painted us this very vivid contrast of a double alienation, right? Be the, the Gentiles endured before Christ from God and from the people of God, right? So there was a double alienation that they endured before Christ. They were, they were separate from Christ and they were separate from his people. And then we, we get this double reconciliation through Christ, right? There's a double reconciliation. For by his death, writes John Stott, demolished, for by his death, Christ demolished the Jew Gentile and God man barriers and is now creating in relation to himself a single, new, multicultural human society, which is both the family God loves and the temple he lives in. Did not, not just blow your mind to see the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven and to know, to see it being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with the cornerstone being Christ Jesus, knowing that that temple, that city coming down out of heaven is you. It's us. Of this gospel, verse 7, let's continue in our text. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, what does he mean he was made a minister? Okay, that's our second big word of this lesson. What is a minister? We need to take just a second to look again into the Greek to get a fuller understanding. That word, um, you can see it, the transliteration there, uh, diakonos, that's the word um, from which we get our English word deacon. So he's saying, I was made a deacon. I was made a minister. I was made a deacon. What it means, that word, um, diokonos, means a servant, a minister. It even can be used to, um, to describe a waiter. Then of anyone who performs any service, an administrator. Now this I think you're going to find interesting as we get a little deeper understanding from um, the parts of this word. Okay, you see it that this, this word is a combination of dia and conus meaning thoroughly and dust thoroughly raise up dust by moving in a hurry and so to minister in the new testament right it usually refers to the lord inspiring his servants to carry out a plan for his people now here's where we get the the more literal understanding of what's going on in this word a.t Rob, robertson says that it properly means to kick up dust as one running an errand. Diakonos is the root of the English terms deacon. We know that, All right, okay. So it's probably connected with this verb, dioko, meaning to hasten after, pursue, originally used or said of a runner, to kick up dust. This word minister, then, here's our bottom line. Here's what we can understand about this word. A minister, and guess what? Paul's not the only one called to the ministry. That's you and that's me. A minister is one who runs with the work of the gospel. 
The minister is one who runs with the work of the gospel, those three legs. So then, the primary question we need to ask is, what is the ministry? What is it? What is the work? What is it we're supposed to be running with? Okay, so now Paul's going to take these next three verses, verses 8, 9, and 10, to elaborate his answer in three stages. Let me just read it um, so that we get this idea here. In fact, let's just read from 8 to the end. He says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints. <laughs> That's a super cool play on words, too. I didn't include it in our lesson, but um, scholars think that the, what he says right there, his name Paulus, meant little um, that he may be playing on his own name here. He was a little man um, physically, like in stature. Um, and he's saying here, though me, though I am the littlest of the littlest. I just personally enjoy life. <laughs> they can put that in there. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see him spelling out the work of the ministry? To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now just as a little aside, scholars are divided. We, well, obviously we're talking about cosmic powers here, right? And there are some scholars who say this is definitely talking about the bad angels, about the demons, the powers and principalities that are against believers, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. Other believers who say, or scholars who say absolutely not, it's the good ones. Uh, it's, it's both. It's all of them. It's the, it is what he says it is. The rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the what? Eternal purpose. This is not plan B. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access, there's that gorgeous word again, with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. Okay, let's look at these, at this now, what is answering our question, what is the ministry? Let's look at it in these three stages as Paul describes it. First he says, verse 8, Making known, here's your blank at letter A, making known Christ's riches to the Gentiles. That's the first thing he says, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I've given you the Greek word there for um, to preach. Okay, To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. To preach, uh, that is the word uh, evangelizo, to preach or to announce good news. Those are your three blanks right there. That's what to preach means. It means to announce good news. What is it? What's the good news? It is that the unsearchable riches of Christ are freely available because of the cross. I hope that you got that down deep in your soul last week. You are a woman. You are a daughter of wealth, of considerable means in the kingdom. You are by no means poor. Riches which include resurrection from the death of sin, victorious enthronement with Christ in the heavenlies, reconciliation with God, incorporation with the people of God in his new humanity, the end of hostility and the beginning of peace, access to the Father through Christ and by the Spirit, membership of his kingdom and household, being an integral part of his dwelling place among men, and all this only a foretaste of yet more riches to come, writes John Stott, namely the riches of the glory of the inheritance which God will give to all his people on the last day. Paul was convinced, as we must be, that Christ never impoverishes those who put their trust in him but he always immeasurably enriches them. Here's the second um, uh, part here of the, of the work of the ministry. So first, to preach, to announce this good news, right, to the Gentiles. Second, making known the mystery to all men. Making known the mystery to all men, by which we would think that Paul's saying here to all believers because those are the ones who can understand this mystery because they have been given the Spirit of God. Now, that phrase here, as you look at it in verse 9, right? So we've, we've uh, 
paraphrase it here, saying, making known the mystery to all men, Paul says to bring to light for everyone, that's to all men, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. That phrase, if you would circle it or underline it or mark it somehow, to bring to light, is the Greek word photizo, to bring to light. It means to enlighten or exactly the way it's translated. Please put those three words in your, in your listening guide, to bring to light. That's what the word means. This had been God's plan from the beginning. This was according, verse 11, to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's plan was never Adam and Eve in a garden. It was always Christ on a cross. It was always there. The prophets wrote about it even though they couldn't understand it. It was hidden for ages. Now I want to show you um, briefly, praise you Lord, I only have one more page in my notes and I'm like, oh my gosh, we have seven minutes and that's because of this because I wanted to show you something so I tried to leave this little, little pocket of time. I want to show you how this could be possible. How can it be possible for something to exist, to always be present and for us to not be able to see it? So I want to invite Kelsey up here because something happened on Sunday. She's going to stand here, and I just want you, before we turn that on, just to look at her. She was, um, <laughs> she was gracious to be our online host for our service this week, and we ran into an unexpected uh, challenge with Kelsey in particular, because Kelsey wears these um, beautiful glasses, and they're super cool. They've got all kinds of colors in the, um, in the frames. And as she was, as you just look at her, you can see her eyes, right? Nothing, I mean, she just has normal looking glasses, right? Very normal looking glasses. And then we went to, to put the light on her so that we could see her face better um, as the online host. And we ran into a problem. You want to turn it on, Therese? So I don't know if you can see, hopefully you can see it there in the camera, but you need to look straight at Kelsey's face. Look at her glasses. Do they look any different? Do you see these neon green mm -hmm. rings mm -hmm. now in her glasses? Mm -hmm. And she had, I mean, depending on how we put the light, she had anywhere from like two to seven of them. One directly in between her eyes and over here, and they were huge and glowing bright neon green. <laughs> and, green. And Teresa and I were trying not to tell her that it was happening. We were going... Um, okay, so you look wonderful, and we need to do something about, she was like, should I just take off my glasses? They were not convincing. <laughs> she was like, should I take off my glasses? I said, no, 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 you don't have to take your glasses off, because, um, you know, you're so used to your glasses, they make you feel more like yourself, so let's not do that. So we ended up having to turn this light off, and you can go ahead and turn it off, Trace. Thank you, Kelsey. We ended up turning that light off and using it completely, that's all right, we don't need it anymore. Don't want to break it. Yeah, a different light. <laughs> Um, that isn't whatever this kind of light is, whatever this specific light is, brought to light in her glasses something that was hidden. And I didn't know that that's what it was when we were in the kitchen. I said, here's what's going on. We have these neon green rings in your glasses and we don't know what they are. We can't get rid of them no matter where we put this light. And she said, oh, that's because I have a green tint in my glasses that's specific to cutting out UV rays, that's specific to um, to counteracting blue light. I have this thing in my glasses. Well, guess what? You can't see it until you have a very specific light. And as soon as whatever that light is, it wasn't the other light. We were able to put this other light on her glasses and we were able to illuminate her face, but we could not see what was hidden there all the time because it wasn't the right kind of light. So something here in Kelsey's glasses that are clear, and we get the right kind of light shining on it, and now we see what has been there all along. Does that make sense then? How something can be hidden, it was always there, the eternal purpose that God has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord has always been in this book. It was always here, but it's not until what happened. In the fullness of time, God was pleased to reveal his son, by whom we now reveal the Holy Spirit, and by whom we now understand, all men understand, that's me and you, Right? The mystery that has been hidden for God, in God for ages, which is that we are full sons and daughters of the living God. The work of Christ to save all men who would receive him by faith, giving them full sonship in his family and in his kingdom, was always God's plan from the beginning. We just could not see it until we were given illumination 
light by the Spirit of God into the Word of God. That's the work of the ministry, to bring the light. Bring the light. Bring the right light. Finally, verse 10. This ministry will serve to, and this is just, just get, just get ready to have your thinking expanded, okay? To make known God's manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Please write that down. To make known God's manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. If we remember back to chapter 1, when we were studying, right, we read verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the what? In the heavenly places. There is something happening in a sphere that we cannot see with our natural eyes. And it is the place both of our blessing and of this incredible drama that is unfolding. But before we look at that, this idea of unfolding, I want you to see that the Greek word for manifold, uh, referring to the manifold wisdom of God, is this word that you have transliterated here before you. I don't know how to pronounce it. Polupoi. Poikolos, maybe? That's the word manifold, and here's what it means. Oh, gosh, you're going to love this. It means multicolored. Mm -hmm. Write that down. That's what manifold means. Manifold means multicolored. It's the same word in the Septuagint used to describe Joseph, Joseph's coat of many colors. It's the same word in a more basic form. We see this. We see God do this, use this multicolored imagery to reflect his his grand design right all throughout the scriptures all the way down to the book of exodus when he's prescribing the way the tabernacle is to be constructed and weaving together these all of these uh, just splendorous different colors right as a foretaste of what's to come but the culmination of the multicolored wisdom of the glorious plan of god reaches its zenith its apex its its climax climax its peak in revelation chapter 7. just jot this down you're going to want to read it later Verses 9 and 10, where we read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every tribe, every nation, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's the multicolored, manifold wisdom of God. And finally, this is where we close. What entity does God choose to make known the mystery of his will, to display his manifold wisdom, right? To everything and everyone in heaven. Those are the angels who are looking down, who are seeking to understand these things, and everything and everyone on earth. And that is from the creation, right, that groans and waits for the sons of God to be revealed so that, so that the creation itself can be renewed all the way from creation to the prophets of old who were looking as if we could think of them looking like on tiptoe trying to look up to what was coming in Christ to, to we ourselves who now are looking up in anticipation of his return, right? What entity does God choose to make known the mystery of his will now and forevermore? What is it? It's the church. Write that down, right in that blank. It's the church. It's us. It's us. Let's end with this thought by John Stott. So then, he writes, as the gospel spreads throughout the world, this new and variegated Christian community develops. It is as if a great drama is being enacted. History is the theater. That makes you study history in a different way. Okay? History is the theater. The world is the stage. And the church members in every land are the actors. God himself has written the play. And he directs and produces it. Act by act, scene by scene, the story continues to unfold. But who are the audience? They are the cosmic intelligences, the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We are to think of them as spectators of the drama of salvation. Thus, the history of the Christian church becomes a graduate school for angels.
You love that, you know. Let's just think about that for a second. Just as there are people, and you've got to, it, I, I'm sure you're like me in this way, where you think, I can't wait to get to heaven to talk to, to him or her and, and, and ask them about this harrowing experience, right, that they had, that um, this, this suffering that they had to endure or overcome. Do you know that there are those in heaven who can't wait to meet you? They can't wait to meet you. They are watching you. They are watching the manifold wisdom of God unfold in and through us. There is more to our salvation than we have even begun to understand. So I want to conclude with these two exhortations and then we'll pray. They're short. Praise you, Lord. Number one, um, today, go and be the church. Brothers and sisters in the household of God, right? Ministers of the mystery, run with the work of the gospel. Be the church. There is much at stake. And then number two, pray for light. Bring the light. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this 12-verse digression that Paul takes before we get to come into and under the incredible prayer that he will pray in and over us, Lord. In the last part here of chapter 3. But before that, Father, to show us what we have been given together as brothers and sisters, having received through your Holy Spirit that we are partakers, that we are sharers, that we are co-heirs of the same blessing the same family, the same inheritance. Thank you, Lord, that you have determined for everyone who will be called a child of God. What love is this that you have lavished on us? That we might be called your children, and that is what we are. Thank you, Lord. This day now, Father, please, by your Spirit, help us to be what we are, your manifold wisdom on display for all of creation, for all of humanity, for all of heaven. Would you, Father, put in our hands as you have put in our souls the light of the face of Jesus Christ by your spirit that all men might see that there is salvation freely available in Jesus Christ who desires and longs for us to be with him where he is forever, to be his, his own people, a special possession, a treasure. Lord, these riches that you have given us, help us invest them well today. That your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This we ask in Jesus' name. All right, now see you next week. We'll finish chapter three. Thank you, Kelsey. Of course. Just had to stand there.